All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Simply Cyber, the YouTube channel designed to help you make and take a cybersecurity career further, faster. And I hope you are so pumped up about today's show because we are talking with an individual who is an absolute expert on uh, money laundering, cryptocurrency. And that's not even why I originally called Charles Finfrock, the man we'll be talking to today, to uh, see if he wanted to be on the show. Charles doesn't even identify as a cybersecurity practitioner. And you might be asking, why are you bringing this guy on, Jerry? Well, check this out. I got introduced to Charles and I was told, hey, listen, this guy is a director of insider threat at a Fortune 100 company. And if you've been working in the field for any period of time, you know that insider threat is like one of those kind of uh, subtle, you know, push to the side things that we all talk about. We all know that it's in our threat model, but we don't really do anything about it. It's really uncomfortable to call like Alice in uh, from accounting and be like, hey, listen, uh, you know, we've got some concerns about you for X, Y, and Z, right? So I wanted to get someone who is a master at insider threat. Now check this out. I get on the call with Charles. We talk about insider threat for like a minute. And then I'm like, well, what else do you do, Charles? He's like, well, I was a career CIA field ops officer for 18 years. And mostly I did money laundering. I'm like, what? And then he's like, yeah, but you know, as, as, uh, as money turned from hard currency to crypto and it became easier to like move money around, I had to become an expert at cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, understanding how those scams work. And now I'm, I'm basically an expert at it. And, and on the side is like a hobby. I still mess with these organizations. And I'm like, dude, you've got to come on. You've got to share these stories with the Simply Cyber audience because this is sick. Okay, so let's bring him in. I want to introduce him. This guy is awesome. Here, let's bring you in. Uh, hold on. Let's give you, give you the just dues. All right, Charles, how are you? Thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I am tremendous. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Okay, so Charles, um, I, I just kind of gave like a, a, a million mile overview on what you are, right? Director of Insider Threat and Career CIA Ops Officer. So I guess, how would you kind of introduce yourself to people uh, who may not be familiar with who you are, just so we can level set uh, as you take us down this journey of the fireside chat that we're about to do? You know, as I, usually as I lead into crypto, I like to start off by saying I'm a, I'm a farm kid from Ohio. So when I talk about these complicated issues, I speak to a person like I speak to myself, you know, in ways that I can understand it. When you ask me, are you a cybersecurity expert? Goodness, no. Most days I can barely get my computer turned on. Now, compared to your average person, I, I do all right. But, uh, you know, I've done a few things. I work for the government. Now I work for the private sector. Uh, I like to wear a black hat and do white hat things when I'm doing it. Uh, but that's that's a little bit about me. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's let's just dive right into what's going on. So. You know, I guess one question that I thought of immediately when I thought of this show was with cryptocurrency, you know, there is the blockchain underneath it, right? So for, for all of those who, who may not be initiated, right, the idea of digital currency, one of the uh, underpinnings of it is that there's a ledger that every transaction is on, right? So you can track, you know, who owns what and where the money goes, and you can validate that someone actually received it, which sounds great in theory. But uh, criminal organizations have taken advantage of this, especially nothing more prevalent than in ransomware, because you can make that transaction quickly. There's no dead drop, less likely to get caught. But that that ledger's there, right? So, so Charles, why is cryptocurrency such an appealing uh, avenue for cyber criminal enterprises? Uh, for you know, for that currency, for that prize that they're seeking out. Yeah, I would say uh, first and foremost, it's first mover advantage. Right. This is this is we, we don't have all the tools in place to detect what we're looking for. It takes away the opportunity to have to go in person. I mean, if you if you kidnap a person and ransom them back now, you generally in the old days. Right. You've got to have someone's going to drop the money and you're going to drop the person back. Well, with ransomware, everything's virtual. Everything's virtual, including the currency you're going to pay it in. Now, the other cool things about cryptocurrency, if you're a criminal, uh, it's really hard to freeze, seize, sanction. Uh and there's a lot of first mover advantage to it. So cryptocurrency, unfortunately, has a lot of association with criminal activity right now. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. I was on a podcast earlier today and I heard a guy say it and I'm going to steal it from him. Crypto is America. Crypto is privacy. Crypto is liberty. Crypto is personal responsibility. It's everything that we love about America. Uh, it's unfortunate that, that as, as always, when we have new tools come up, right? Uh, the internet only used for only used by pornographers. No, it's a tool. It's value agnostic, much like cryptocurrency. 
you know, the car. Well, gosh, John Dellinger used the car to, to get away from a bank robbery. Should we ban cars? No, absolutely not. And I would even go more and say, you know, ransomware, ransomware wouldn't exist without the Internet. So is the Internet bad? Absolutely not. Uh, so for all those same reasons, cryptocurrency, value agnostic. It's just a tool. You can use Bitcoin to build a hospital. You can use Bitcoin to pay someone to blow up a hospital. Crypto's value agnostic. It's a tool used by criminals, but it's not criminal in of itself. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So uh, before, we, well, I guess let's stick with the criminal element of it, right? So I know, like, so Bitcoin is the uh, coin du jour, right, of criminal enterprises right now. And there's like, if you look at Coinbase or any of those other exchanges, it seems like there's a new digital currency coming out every day, right? Like it's, it's everybody's trying to get to market and sell something that is basically, uh, you know, like out of thin air. Uh, why is Bitcoin so popular as the, the you know, the, the criminal's choice of currency? Yeah, great question. So Bitcoin's the big daddy, right? Bitcoin was the OG cryptocurrency. There were other projects before, but what we know is cryptocurrency today started by Satoshi in 2008 with the paper, nine with the Genesis block. It's the big daddy. Now, it's, it's fascinating, actually. I love Bitcoin. Anyone who's a regulator or who's a white hat should encourage everybody to use Bitcoin. Because as you mentioned, all the data is transmitted and stored on the blockchain that you can look at. It's great. Bitcoin is the worst for illicit activity. Uh, but wh why do so many criminals use it? One, there's a perception of an anonymity, which is silly. If you're using it and you think it's anonymous, please keep doing it. That's great for us. Second, it's the most trusted. You know, if I was a black hat, black hat, I would be using different kinds of cryptocurrency. I would be using privacy coins. I would be using things like that. But at the end of the day, it's it's uh, much less used. It's much less adopted. There's still that little bit of trust between criminals. So even though these really obscure, you know, there's 6,800 or I don't, I've lost track of all the all the cryptocurrency projects out there, most of which are vaporware and 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 uh, uh, words that rhyme with Bitcoin uh, to describe the, the fecal matter of a lot of these coins. But. You know, the reason why Bitcoin's used is because people trust it. It's the same reason why you could make a transaction in a Turkish lira or a Zimbabwe and whatever. Uh, but you do it in a dollar because it's the most trusted currency. It's the most well-known currency. It's the most uh, easily obtainable cryptocurrency. Yeah, that, that is really interesting. So one thing you did touch on, and, and I'm curious why it's not uh, more prevalent, right? Someone in chat also mentioned it. I think it's Monero. Monero coin is the one that is like super privacy and super... Yep. Uh, encrypted right so you know if i was a bad guy which i'm not right so don't 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 bring me down charles if i was a bad guy like i'd be like let's go on monero like i i'm stunned why monero isn't skyrocketed past bitcoin just because of the amount of volatility and transactions that are happening with all of this ransomware yeah great question so th there's a couple things that are going on with that right i mean when you talk about criminal first mover advantage you talk about the illicit use i would say probably realistically uh, professionals in the dark arts, professional in the space, probably are using Monero and other like privacy coins. Now, here's the challenge and the opportunity, depending on which side of the equation you're on. It's that, tran it's that, it's that transfer to fiat, right? There's got to be a fiat off ramp because right now it's hard to pay for all the goods and services you want in Monero. So a lot of times you're trying to take that cryptocurrency and cash it out at an exchange. Well, here's the deal, right? There's a lot of cryptocurrencies that are regulated that don't accept Monero because of all those privacy functions. They can't meet their know your customer, anti-money laundering, KYC, AML requirements. So your big your big exchanges like Coinbase doesn't list Monero. Monero's got such a such a heavy association with uh, criminal activity that that the legitimate exchanges you know don't don't use it. Now, I, I was in a really, you know, I, I love the crypto space because you get to say things like, I was in a really vigorous conversation with a guy named Fluffy Pony, and uh, which is a true story, right? One of the OGs in Monero about privacy coins. And we're going back and forth and I'm saying, why in the world do you need privacy coins? And he went back and had a great answer. He said, hey, do you put all your banking information on the internet for anybody to see? No. He goes, well, why would you do that with your cryptocurrency? That's why I like Monero. That's why I like the privacy features of it. And I said, you know what? Point to you, Fluffy Pony. Mm -hmm. And God bless you being Fluffy Pony, and I get to say Fluffy Pony on professional broadcasts. <laughs> I love it. So, so you're saying that um, all like so it's the regulators that are are basically deterring the major exchanges from wanting to adopt Monero. Well, for there's example, a, yeah, exactly. I mean, the people that want to use Monero want to remain anonymous. 
Well, if you've got KYC AML requirements, you know, I was just talking a client through that today about how to get registered with with Coinbase. And I was telling them, don't freak out. You're going to have to provide all of your information. You're going to have to provide your passport. You're going to have to provide a picture. You're going to have to provide the people that are using Monero don't want to do that. And so therein, therein lies the rub. Now, I'll tell you another one. You know, uh, Monero shooting past Bitcoin from a value perspective. The vast majority of users of cryptocurrency want it because of the positive attributes of it. Right. It's a possible currency to replace other fiat currencies that that have varying values. Um, so, all, you know, less than according to chain analysis, the biggest, greatest you know, blockchain forensic company that's out there, less than one percent of transactions of cryptocurrency are actually used for illicit purposes. That's compared to about three to five percent of U.S. dollar transactions. So, you know, let's just keep that in mind that despite what some of our senior political leaders say when they make that initial uh, association with cryptocurrency to illicit activity, that's not what the majority of people are using it for. Second, why is the value of Bitcoin shooting up and other privacy coins sort of trailing behind it? Well, here's the deal. The things that are making these cryptocurrencies really raise in value are investors and investors, including institutional investors. Well, in an institutional investor, one of these companies that's, that's bought a billion dollars for their assets balance sheet or for their company's balance sheet, you know, your micro strategies, your squares, some other big companies that you know out there aren't going to be investing in something that has such a heavy taint with illicit activity. And so Bitcoin is the the acknowledged sort of, uh, I don't want to say legitimate because it would say delegitimate on the other ones. I would just say the investment vehicle of choice that's regulated and that, that, that big companies are going to want to invest in. Ethereum's coming up behind it, but you don't hear you don't hear an institutional investor say, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to put a billion and a half dollars into Monero or yeah. in some other kind of obscure coin out there. It's just not not going to happen. Yeah, I almost feel like Bitcoin was originally there, so it it kind of got a it's almost has like a gold association with it that it's 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 trustworthy because it's you know financial you know institutions like yeah. bedrock it's OG, um, yeah that so that's really that's really interesting. So um, to kind of pivot, it, you had mentioned that you know, only a small amount is used for illicit activities. Uh, turning to your experience with money laundering, mm -hmm. what, like how is how is crypto like I guess even for myself, but really for the audience, please, if you would, um, can you kind of roll back what money laundering is? Uh, we've all seen like, you know, Goodfellas and Casino where it's like, oh, you just stand up a cash business and funnel cash through it, right? I was thinking of Ozarks this morning when I was getting ready for this interview. Um, so can you break it down? What is the reality of money laundering? And if you want to take it back to hard currency and then bring it into crypto, that's fine. But uh, just educate us, please, Charles. Yeah, so let's step back. Let's talk about what money, money laundering is and what money laundering is it isn't. So money laundering at its, at its basis is basically taking ill-gotten funds, right? That's the one key piece. These are funds that are generated from illegal activity and then washing that through the financial system to hide the origin of it, to place it into the financial system, to integrate, to, okay, so <laughs> placement layer and integration, you're going to, let's say, uh, let's say you and me are running a, uh, a, a illegal casino, right? And I have thousands of yes. dollars of of bills, right? You and me, man. Illegal right. casino. I love it. Right. So now I can't just go down to the car dealership and, and buy a car for a hundred thousand dollars in fives and tens, because what's going to happen is they're they're mandated or a bank's mandated to report that as a suspicious activity report. Mm -hmm. So what you and I are going to do is buy a laundromat, literally a laundromat, coin operated, something like that. It's great. So now all the coins that we get from our machines that aren't otherwise taken, you know, you don't look at, we're going to take those hundred dollar bills and we're going to mix them all up. And so we're going to we're going to do that. We're going to run it through a legitimate business. And now we're going to deposit that in our bank and say, hey, this is the proceeds from Jerry and Charles's laundromat. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, OK, that makes sense. It's a laundromat. Here's the here's the genesis of those of that money. OK, fine. Now I can use that for real things. I have to take the illicit money. I've got to run it through some machinations, placement, layer it and get it into the traditional financial system so I can spend it. Mm -hmm. That's money laundering. Right. OK, perfect. Yeah. Yes. And we and we saw that in uh, Breaking Bad with the car wash. We saw it in Ozarks with the hotel. Uh, yep. So basically you you stand up a business that you really don't care if it's successful or not. And you just pump money through it. You need a cash based business. Mm -hmm. Success. Success is irrelevant. Success is. Is it a vehicle for laundering the ill gotten gains that I have separately? OK, I'm not right. looking to make money out of my car wash. I'm looking to have a, a, an ability. And again, I'm not trying to besmirch anyone out there who's running car washes. But, you know. I'm trying to find a cash based business that that's one of the reasons why casinos had always for the longest time been associated with money laundering. 
cash based business where you can't really predict who's going to win, who's going to lose. You just need to take dirty money, mix it in with clean money and then send it on through the through the system. OK, yeah. So. All right. So we've got our illegal laundry mat that uh, ben, Ben's calling out that we're just crushing it at a million dollars a week in a in a small town. Right. Right. Um, you know, we've got uh, fresh press laundry, Charles and Jerry's. OK, so yep. so we've got our laundry mat. We're, we're pumping money through it. Why do we care? Why do we want to move into Bitcoin? Like, wh like wh what's the what's the right. to transition? So here's the cool thing. Right. Uh, and you just you just said it. So uh, Jerry and Charles's clean money, clean money laundromat. How yeah. much money can you move through a laundromat in a week? How much can you move through in a month? And at the end of the day, how do I take that money? You know, and a lot of, you know, so when we think of money laundering, we think of everything from organized crime to narcotics is the big one, right? How do you take all those hundred dollar bills worth of drugs that you sell in the U.S. and launder that currency back to Mexico or back to Colombia or something like that? Because you can't physically carry it. It's really funny. There's some <laughs> if you've ever literally carried a box full of a million dollars or five million dollars or ten million dollars, it's actually hard. It's heavy. It's bulky. Definitely first world problems, but it's a problem. Uh, so yeah, so can you can you imagine you're like you're like unloading your ten million dollars from your car and you're like Jesus, oh, like I just need a break from moving this cash. Like it's I, I tell me. you, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. At one point in the middle of the night, I found myself on the side of the road in the foreign country, and I pop open my trunk and I'm just throwing cardboard boxes into another guy's trunk, and it was like eight million dollars in bound hundred dollar bills, and I'm yeah. sweating, and I'm like, man, this is this is hard work. Uh, it's kind of like bailing hay, except it ain't hay we're moving. Yeah, uh, but it's for the good guys. For the good guys. Yeah, I mean, you're like dabbing your brow with a hundred dollar bill. It just like <laughs> no, I, I didn't touch that stuff, man. That's got to be clean accounting. Uh... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, so please, please continue on. Yeah. So, so we've got we've got so why Bitcoin? Yep. Okay, so Bitcoin, uh, you can move money with cryptocurrency 24/7, 365. You don't have to go through any bank. You can you can do it in a whole lot of different ways, but. Here's one of the conversations I had with a, a friend of mine from a logistics company, uh, DHL. I'm standing in Cincinnati. I'm talking to a guy and I said, hey, uh, well, how can I how long would it take me to get a package from here to Beijing? He said, listen, you can ship an iron anvil from from Cincinnati to Beijing. going to take about 18 hours. I said, no kidding, because you know what? If I tried to send a traditional uh, money exchange, currency exchange to Beijing through an ACH transfer, it's going to take three to five days. If I use, if I wire it, they're going to charge me 10%. If I send it via cryptocurrency, I can get the $10 million that I need to Beijing in 15 minutes. Punta. I don't have to go through a bank. I don't have to go through an intermediary, a third party. It's point to point, peer to peer. Uh, so the ability to move massive amounts of money, practically frictionless, immediately without having to rely on a third party. That's why, you know, criminals and things like that look toward cryptocurrency. And the biggest part was the perceived anonymity of it, right? Again, like we talked about, if I if I take $100,000 in cash and I take it down to my bank and I try to make a deposit, they are going to file a suspicious activity report to the Financial Intelligence and Crimes Enforcement Network, to FinCEN, or to, you know, Treasury. And and those kind of cash reporting rules are all over the world, where there is none of that in crypto. Uh, there. I mean, it's, it's starting to be with exchanges and things like that. But for the most part, I could send you money right now, bing, $100,000, and it's just me and you. There's no third party that's overlooking it, no third party that's going to report that transaction. Those are the kind of things that turn turn criminals on. Yeah, so so that's interesting. So um, what, are you seeing in the international space a, a greater adoption of, of Bitcoin? Because you, you're talking about I can send a transaction, and you're talking about uh, what sounds like legal transactions and like you know mm -hmm. actual business. But yep. but one of the knocks on d digital currency is that it's so volatile that, you know, today it's worth 30 grand for Bitcoin and yep. tomorrow it's worth 27. So, you know, obviously that's scary for risk based investors. So is that is that play into the, the fact like what, what's the adoption internationally? Um, you know, since you said earlier that only yep. a couple percent is used for illicit activity. Yeah, my man, I, I, I love that question. So here's the deal. The hardest people in the world to explain cryptocurrency to are Americans. <laughs> because our because our because our dollar our, our currency works and our banks work, but you yeah. go into a lot of places in Africa or South America or Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe, where their banks don't work. You know, you may have to pay money to deposit money in a bank account. Their currency is super volatile and volatile in an inflationary way, so that you know your one dollar today is fifty cents tomorrow, and that's not hyperbole. That's just the way it works. There was at one point forty some odd countries that had inflationary 
uh, expenses that were like 40% or more. I mean, it's, it, it's a ton. So cryptocurrency is volatile. Yes. In the long term, it's been an up channel. So yes, technically, if you bought a Bitcoin 10 years ago for a dollar and it's worth $50,000 today, that's a heck of a lot of volatility, but not the volatility we mine necessarily. You know, co contrast that to the Zimbabwe and whatever they use. It's got the, the million dollar bill where you have to carry a, a wheelbarrow down to be able to pay for something because their cryptocurrency is so worthless. And, and it's not just countries like Zimbabwe. I mean, we're talking about Venezuela. We're talking about Turkey. We're talking about a lot of countries that are, I don't want to say real countries, but real countries that have a challenge with their financial system. In the U.S., it just doesn't make sense. You know, we're just used to our dollar being so stable, relatively stable, and our banks working. Now, I would argue that if you think that the U.S. dollar is stable and you don't think that there's an effort underway to devalue and debase the U.S. dollar by all the rampant printing we're doing, you're not paying attention. You don't understand basic economics. Uh, so for me, Bitcoin is a lovely anti-inflationary hedge against the U.S. dollar. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretty, I mean, I don't want to say bold statement, but like that's an interesting statement considering how expensive Bitcoin is. Of course, you can buy one one eighteen thousandth of a Bitcoin, right? So that, that's a, that's another funny thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is you can buy however much you want and it, it fluctuates at the percentage just the same, whether you own one or a fraction yeah. of one. Uh, so yeah, it, it is pretty cool. Now, you had mentioned something earlier, uh, Charles, that really was interesting uh, to me, especially... Uh, to the cybersecurity community where privacy is becoming more and more overlaid with, with the things that we're responsible for, frankly. And you talked about the perceived anonymity of Bitcoin, right? And we talked a little bit earlier about Monero and why that's, that, that's a privacy one. Can you kind of share with us why, like, like why it's not actual anonymous and how, yeah. you know, in your experience, the work you've done from, for what you can share with us, right. From that's been cleared. Um, how is how is that perceived anonymity uh, a, a fallacy or a mistake of bad guys? Yeah, absolutely. OK, so here's the deal with let me let's let's step back and talk a little bit about what a Bitcoin transaction looks like and what information is transmitted and stored on the blockchain and how it's stored. This is a really important point. Every bit can every Bitcoin transaction transmits information to the blockchain. That information includes the sending wallet, the receiving wallet, the amount and the date. Now, the perceived anonymity comes because that wallet address doesn't have a name on it. It's like a 24-digit alphanumeric or 34-digit alphanumeric string of characters and numbers. Well, that's great until you can associate that with a name. It's sort of like saying to yourself, well, I use a phone number. You don't know my name, so I'm anonymous. Well, you're only anonymous until I figure out what your phone number is and I associate that to you. Why Bitcoin is definitely not anonymous, once we're able to identify that wallet, the two wallet, the send wallet. Now I can use a basic blockchain explorer or a much more sophisticated blockchain forensics tool. And I can watch that wallet and every wallet that that wallet has ever transacted with both receiving money and sending money. And so the art here, it's oh, it's beautiful. I take the sit, you know, so let's say I'm investigating a scam. I look at where the money's being sent to Okay, fine. Now that's my scam wallet. Now I look and see where's all that money being sent to. And I can associate that with an aggregator wallet that may be connected to several other scam wallets. Now I can follow that money to another wallet that may be an exchange. What did we just say was it an exchange? PII, personal identifiable information. Now we can subpoena that information and we can say, here are the criminal actors behind that. Or in my old world, we just stole the information. Uh, you know, because that was, you know, because we had to do stuff for the good guys. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. why Bitcoin is perceived to be anonymous. Now, I will say, but hey, look, in 2013, 2014, Silk Road's up and running. We didn't have Bitcoin forensics tools. So for all intents and purposes, it was anonymous. But here's here's the rub. And here's the thing that people sometimes don't remember, don't, you know, all that good stuff. Um, it's only anonymous until we figure out how to walk it back. And the data never goes away. The blockchain, it's a fancy word for it, is immutable. But immutable is basically it's carved into stone tablets. It's always going to be there. So even if I don't have the answer today, five years from now, I may develop the ability to walk it back. And once I can walk it back, I can de-anonymize it all. So the Bitcoin blockchain transaction. So for the law enforcement side or the government side or the people that favor regulation, we want everybody using Bitcoin. Use it, use it, use it. I love it. Because right now, if I hand you a, a, a bag full of $100 bills, and you walk away, that transaction never happened unless you saw it. Mm -hmm. But if I sent you a bag bags worth $100 bills on the blockchain, it's there forever. So if you think about that, what I'm looking for, you know, the investigative ability to walk these things back, I want people using Bitcoin. 
All right. I, I like it. We're starting to get some questions in here specific to what you're talking about. Ben talks about about crypto tumblers, and I don't even know about this. I like. I'd like you to answer Ben's question, but I, I'm also wanting to know, like, can the bad guys move faster than you can move as a good guy on getting yeah. the cash? You know. So, but and maybe that's what crypto tumblers are. I don't know. But what about crypto yep. tumblers? Yeah. Let me talk to you about tumblers, mixers, shifters. Oh man. All right. So check it. Here. Here it is. First off, uh, there's always a first mover advantage to criminal activity, right? No matter what it is, someone's going to take it and use it for criminal you know, gain first. Well, law enforcement or whoever, the regulators are going to catch up. It's just a matter of time. Punch, counterpunch. And that's why the world's so interesting. It's not a static problem set. And I used to do that on the other side. Punch, counterpunch, man. I, I'm going to develop a new technique and I'm going to be ahead of you. You may catch me in a bit, but now I'm going to be iterating and moving on. Okay. What's a tumbler? What's a mixer? These are sites that are set up so that if you basically, I'm going to, I'm going to explain this in, in kind of basic English. So if you bring a hundred dollar bill and I bring a hundred dollar bill and Ben brings a hundred dollar bill and Peter and Erica bring hundred dollar bills, we all throw it on the table. We mix it up. We take out a hundred dollar bill, less a little bit of transaction fee, and then we walk away. Now that hundred dollar bill that I obtained illegally, or, you know, maybe let's just say hypothetically that the serial number was recorded. Well, I still have the same value, but I don't have the same dollar anymore. I don't have the same hundred dollar bill anymore. A crypto tumbler or mixer is the same thing. They're places where people can bring like currencies, mix them up. You know, everybody brings their Bitcoins in, everybody gets a Bitcoin out. But just what I talked about, how we were able to follow the coins going through wallets, well, this breaks the chain or breaks the attribution. Now, I will say that, you know, look, punch, counterpunch. They've been punching on this for a while. One could imagine there's counterpunches to it. Those are mixers and tumblers. And there's been also law enforcement interaction to just take them down mm -hmm. because there's, there's, that, there's that argument of why do you need this service? If you're not involved in illicit activity, why do you need it? Okay, so that's a that's a mixer and a tumbler. Those I don't want to say those are easy, but if you're in with a like-minded currency, we can follow it. Now we've got a shifter. Where does the word shifter come from? It comes from Shapeshift, the company that was originally set up by Eric Vore. He's an American who's a libertarian, it's based out of Colorado. Shifters are places where we same thing. We come to the card table, but now I bring a hundred dollar bill. You bring 100 yen, somebody else brings 100 euro, somebody else brings 100 ruble. Mm -hmm. We throw that on the table, mix it up, and now my $100 becomes 100 ruble. And your 100 yen becomes 100 yuan. And so you're doing what's called cross-chain jumping. So let's say that forensically I'm watching your Bitcoin go through the blockchain. Well, boop, now it stops. Now I don't know what chain you jumped to. I don't know where you shifted to. Now I got all kinds of problems. Uh -huh. There's some solutions to that, but... But they're complicated. And uh, the U.S. government, the regulatory environment and the EU and some of the FATF, the financial action task force that handles money launder regulations have basically said, hey, shifters, you have to collect, know your customer, anti-money laundering, KYC, AML information. Because if not, this anonymous shifting environment is no bueno. We can't we can't do it because it's just so so ripe with potential for facilitating illicit transactions. Yeah, and I'll tell you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was no, going to tell you a story, but I didn't ask your question. No, no, I, I was going to pivot a little bit. It just makes you wonder if, like, if, if these organizations are using mules, you know, people who are in financial dire straits, to say, "Hey, why don't you open a, an account and be my be my FYDCA, whatever that was you mm -hmm. just said, and, yep. and then continue shifting, and then you know the bad guy pays them off for the risk that they might get investigated." And is that, I mean, is that what's happening? Because it uh, seems you know, that's, like that's that's the obvious thing. <laughs> It's part of what you can do, but but think about that, right? The difference between cryptocurrency and the traditional cash mule. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. I hand you a bag of hundred dollar bills. If somebody doesn't see it, nobody knows I gave it to you. But if this is cryptocurrency, I can look and record that I sent the money to my mule. Yep. Okay. Yep. Right? Solid. All that's yep. recorded. Yep. So again, so people think it's anonymous, but it's 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 badass. We can follow it. <laughs> I love it. Are there any blockchain blockchain forensics tools out there that people can play with or mess with? Absolutely. Or, yeah, yeah. The, big, the big ones that are in the space, the big daddies, uh, Chainalysis, Elliptic, Cypher Trace are the big companies. But you don't have to do that. You can start doing this by going on and search Blockchain Explorer, literally Blockchain Explorer. What that'll do, it'll pull up information from the blockchain. You can put a wallet address at the top of it. And just look at it. It'll show you every transaction that's happened with that wallet. And there's some really cool ones out there. If you, if, Okay, so for the cybersecurity folks that get excited, right? WannaCry. WannaCry was ransomware that was that was we uh, attributed to the North Koreans. 
right? There are three blockchain addresses that they wanted the ransomware payments sent into. Well, those three blockchain, those three wallet addresses are still live. You could take those wallet addresses, put them in a block explorer and literally start following the money and see the money that's still in there that the North Koreans are shitting on. It's really freaking cool. Uh, so you can do that. And, and that's the basic way to do it. If you want to get really fancy, you need a you need a paid tool. But there's a lot of free tools out there. OK, so if, if you know, piggybacking on that, Eric is asking um, about, you know, good friend of the show, Eric. Thanks for being here. Uh, awesome. You know, any other uh, resources, you know, maybe not just tools, but like, you know, like you just said, you told us how to use that, uh, yep. that that particular tool. But if they wanted to dig in a little bit more to figure out what's going on, what, what do you recommend is, you know, step one? Yeah. You know, look, there at this point now, when I started getting into this and one of the reasons I got into it, you know, 2016, I'm reading about Silk Road and I'm hearing about the magic anonymous Internet money. And I'm like, man, that's the coolest thing in the world. And so I go to my friends in the government and I'm like, hey, we're the government, man. We are we are high speed. Certainly we uh, we know what's going on. Somebody teach me about this magic Internet money. <laughs> crickets, crickets, crickets. And I'm like, what in the hell? And so I started going to conferences. I started reading. I started reading. There wasn't even books. I started reading Reddit threads. I started listening to podcasts and just started talking to people in the space and then sort of taught myself how to do it. Now, people that are starting in 2021 have a lot more resources in 2016. There are good books out there that talk about the topic. There are great podcasts. There's a lot of good influencers out there. There's still conferences and things like that. But here's my secret trick to learn it. Everything else is theoretical, right? Every, it's like trying to talk to somebody about coding, but just describing it to them and then describing it back to you. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is better experienced than it is explained. The best hundred dollars you can do isn't go isn't to go to a conference, isn't to buy a stack of books. The best hundred dollars you can do is go onto Coinbase, buy a hundred dollars in Bitcoin, and then start moving it around. See what it feels like. See what it acts like. Set up a separate wallet. Move it between yourself. Now take that wallet address and plug it into the Block Explorer and see what that transaction actually looks like on the blockchain. Uh, get out there and, and and mix it up with it. And that was what really put me over the top. Was once I started doing that, and I'm like, oh, oh. Oh, this is it. Oh, and it really got me asking a lot of questions. Now, as you can probably tell, I'm not a super sophisticated technical person. Luckily, for probably not relevant for your audience because you guys strike me as really savvy. But just like you don't have to understand how the Internet works to send an email, you don't have to understand how the blockchain works to transact in cryptocurrency. You can. It's fascinating. It's really worth studying. But at the same time, my mom doesn't know how the internet works. She's still using an AOL account, but she sends email. Same for most people using cryptocurrency. So, yeah. you know, dive in. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I've had a Coinbase uh, a wallet in the background uh, or, you know, back in the day. And it, I didn't realize you could do that level. I thought like part of Coinbase's value add is that they abstract you from having to understand all that stuff. So it's interesting that you say, you know, take a hundred bucks, play around with it and uh, get that education. That's That's a really... Uh, and who knows, maybe you make a hundred, uh, a couple hundred bucks, you know, you hit the right wave. It wor worse things in the world than playing with something that may be five times worth what it is today. And I'm going to answer this. I, I know I'm not necessarily responding to everybody in the chat, but there is something I saw that I want to, I want to respond to. Sure. I didn't invest in crypto. I didn't invest in Bitcoin in early 2017 because each coin was like $1,500. And I'm like, I'm not going to spend $1,500 on this. That's silly. Well, the only thing that was silly was I waited till it was 4,500 and then I started. <laughs> you you don't have to buy a full Bitcoin. You can buy as small of a piece as you want. You can buy $5 worth of Bitcoin. You can buy $10 worth of Bitcoin. Unlike a traditional, you know, like a stock where you can't buy a fraction of a stock. I mean, you can now with some of the exchanges, but I could, you know, recently you couldn't buy a fractional share of AT&T. Well, Bitcoin, you can buy as much or as little of it as you want. Mm -hmm. So don't let that stand in your way. If you don't have a hundred dollars and you got you've got five dollars, put five dollars in. You know, yeah, move I, it around. Yeah, I, I'd go as far as saying um, for those out there, like you have to look a little bit, but it's not. I mean, like twenty minutes of looking. But there's a lot of YouTubers that do like financial. Like this is not financial advice, but it's basically yep. financial advice. And a lot of them have kind of affiliate programs where if you sign up with Coinbase or you sign up with Robinhood or whatever they'll give you $5 worth of Bitcoin, literally. Yep. And to them, it's like, who cares? It's five bucks to get a new client. Um, so you could literally not, you could invest zero and get your get your $5 in Bitcoin and start messing around with the, the tools you're talking about. And so we've got really fancy terms for that, like a Bitcoin faucet, 
-hmm. a Bitcoin faucet or a cryptocurrency faucet is someone who just gives it away. Mm -hmm. And you may think, now, why in the heck would anybody give it away? Eric Voorhees and, and Roger Ver used to walk around crypt, uh, Bitcoin meetups back in 2012, 2013, just handing out Bitcoin, right? You download a wallet. I'm going to send you a Bitcoin or five, you know, when it had, you know, 50 cents a coin or something like that. The goal for that is to, to push adoption. And yep. so when I do I, when I do cryptocurrency classes and things like that, I will walk people through downloading a wallet. I will send them five dollars or ten dollars worth of Bitcoin because now you've got it. Mm -hmm. And it's this it's this crypto virus, man. Once I've infected you with it, you're going to get super excited about it. You're going to learn more about it. You're going to want to buy it and you're going to help improve the infrastructure and the ecosystem. And the more you do that. OK, here's my selfish motivation. Right. The more you buy Bitcoin, the more my, my Bitcoin's worth. Well, I hear we all win. It's yeah. great. Yeah, no, and you, you see that um, it's kind of funny too because it's not really regulated. I mean, we saw something that could have been considered tampering in the in the stock market recently, where um, you know, I guess Elon Musk uh, had, had had promoted saying that Bitcoin would be used, and then backed it backed it up saying that it was you know not uh, eco friendly, and, and and you saw like a surge go up, and then uh, when it it was going to be adopted by. Um, Elon Musk's companies and then uh, went down when they made that claim. And, you know, you can't say that he was doing that uh, to, to manipulate the, uh, the the value of that stock or that that currency. But at the same time, it's not really a regulated market. It's it's a it's a uh, open market for for anyone. Right. So it, it is interesting that it has that level of influence or volatility associated with it as well. Look, that, you know, as we talk about uh, pricing coin, there's a lot of different, you know, how to trade coins and the information that's important. Let me let me shift it to another person, uh, John McAfee. Uh, peace be upon him. Yeah. Uh, so John McAfee caught a lot of problems, rightly so, because he was taking money to pump cryptocurrencies. Right. You give John McAfee one hundred thousand dollars and he will tweet about your coin and say how great it is. And, and what they're doing, they're not giving him one hundred thousand dollars in dollars. They're giving him one hundred thousand dollars in his worthless token. He's going to go out there and shill for it. It's going to pump up. He's going to dump it. He's going to make $500,000. And people are like, well, I mean, if John McAfee says it's great, why not? Right. Uh, and, and it's just it's one of the things with cryptocurrency scams. There is nothing under the sun that's new. All the same scams that they use cryptocurrency for the same scams that they've done for thousands of years. Ponzi schemes. And you pay me one Bitcoin and I'll give you two Bitcoin back tomorrow. That doesn't exist. Unless you want to do that, and then send me a Bitcoin and I'll send two back to you tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Uh, but all these things are just, you know, pump and dumps and all that. They're just they're, they're, they're classic. And you alluded to it earlier. The regulation around cryptocurrency is a little less developed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's th there's a little more uh, latitude for people to take advantage of uh, unprotected consumers. But part of that is the ethos of cryptocurrency. One of the reasons why I love it so much. Uh, cryptocurrency removes third party risk right? Banks and intermediaries and all that. It doesn't remove first party risk. You are ultimately responsible. This is the ultimate big boy pants currency. You screw it up, you lose it. Yeah. You're silly and somebody takes advantage of you. Sorry. Darwin has spoken. You're out. Uh, so, you know, in a lot of ways, the crypto community doesn't want that, that regulation. Now the investor community obviously does. And a lot of people do, but yeah, no, the, the regulatory environment is still a little bit uh, nascent in the yeah. space. So an, another kind of uh, question that comes to mind around all this, because you're talking about the, the ability to trace it, blockchain's immutable, all these things. We have seen multiple uh, instances where an entire exchange goes down overnight. Mt. Yep. Gox comes to mind immediately. And you can Google Mt. Gox, G-O-X. And it was rumored that the guy who was in charge of Mt. Gox basically, you know, cleaned everyone out and, you know, just took off. Right. And and, you know, it was rumored. But like, here's my thing. If 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 you're in charge of an exchange and you clean out everyone's wallet and put it in your pocket, basically open the bank vault at the bank, load the duffel bags yourself and walk out and say the bank's closed tomorrow. How with all this uh, attribution, how could that to use Mt. Gox as the example, how on earth could that guy who ran Mt. Gox ever cash out? Yeah, so couple of things with that, right? So that, that happened in 2013, 2014, before a lot of the blockchain forensics tools were set up in place. Okay. One, two, do you know what Mt. Gox stands for? No. That's <laughs> why so I love cryptocurrency, man. So here's, uh, hold on, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diverge just quickly. Okay. Cryptocurrency is hard to explain because of three factors. One, 
it's the lexicon of international finance. These highfalutin international finance terms. We're going to talk about disintermediation. We're going to talk about correspondent banking. We're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Really complicated. Second vertical is it talks about all this really complicated technical cryptography, computer science terminology, right? Every once in a while, I throw out there elliptic curve cryptography, not because I know what it is, because it makes me sound smart, sort of. So here's two different things that are really complicated to understand. And just on the off chance that you are, you are, you're brilliant and can handle international finance and highfalutin technological terms, they throw in a third component. And the third component is made up stuff. It's like Elvin, it's Klingon, it's nerd language mixed in, right? So it's really hard. And it's like hodl. What does hodl mean? Hodl, hodl, hodl. Well, hodl happened back in the day when a dude was drunk and the price of Bitcoin was plunging and he's taping, I'm or typing, I'm going to hodl. I'm going to hodl because he couldn't type hold because he was hammered. Well, now we all talk about hodling. We've got a new type of encryption that a coin is going to use. It's called Mimble Wimble. What the hell's Mimble Wimble? It's from Harry Potter. They just make stuff up. Doge, okay. Right. Dogecoin. That, a meme, yeah. right? Doge, we're going to take a meme of a dog and make it a coin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why do I, why do I delve down in that? Mount Gox. Everyone's like, man, that must be a, uh, a mountain in Japan. Mount Gox literally stands for magic, the gathering online exchange. That exchange was built to trade magic, the gathering trading cards. Interesting. Interesting. And that was the level of technical sophistication and security that was built into that exchange. The first person that built it flipped it from a, from a, a, a trading card, you know, a, a fantasy trading card site to a cryptocurrency site. And back in the day, yeah, not much difference, right? They didn't have a lot of different value. Well, it started to get value. He got nervous. He backed out. He put it up for sale. Mark Capellas bought it, right? Tuxedo man, Mark Capellas, the guy that we all know is the, you know, the guy behind Mount Cox. Well, Mark didn't upgrade the security. And so... He didn't upgrade the security. He didn't upgrade the, the the record keeping. There's a couple of really good accounts of the story. There's one I just read the other day called Crypto Wars that talks about a lot of exchange. And it's got a whole chapter on Mt. Gox and all the things that happened here. So here's the deal. I don't think it was necessarily that he looted the place. Okay. Coins were getting stolen. He didn't have a good enough record keeping in place. Things were getting lost. And he got in over his head quickly. And so at the end of the day, he kind of shut the doors and was like, nah, I don't know what to do here. And people were flying. You know, Roger Ver's got great stories about flying in to help him. People that believed in cryptocurrency and believed in Bitcoin and said, you can't fail. If you fail, this whole ecosystem could go down. But the whole dadgum ecosystem was built on Magic the Gathering online exchange. <laughs> so here's, here's, here's a, a long story to say we are, we are so far from that now. Right. Real people are in real cybersecurity is in place. Now, you still hear about exchanges getting hacked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you should not keep your coins on an exchange. It, it's not best practice at all. You're, you're you know, it's, you have the potential for losing them. But th those kind of issues, for the most part, unless you're trading on some, you know, obscure Chinese or South Korean exchanges, no offense to my Asian friends, uh, can potentially be hacked a little bit easier. But for the most part, those those issues have have passed. Kind of like when we first started coding, right? When we first started the internet, there were gaping holes in it. And we just didn't know. Yeah. Uh, oh, I say we, uh, you guys, not me. I wouldn't code anything. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It, it's good. Yeah, there's an excellent book for those who haven't read it. Clifford Stoll's Cuckoo's Egg. Uh, oh, yeah. It is an awesome story uh, about, you know, basically the 70s and, and how widely open everything was from a, from a security perspective. Uh, we had a bit of a technical question in the crowd. Um, that, you know, from a, from a good, a good friend here, you know, any thoughts around, and this gets a little technical, but I, I do think it's relevant just because, um, people are using GPU cards, setting up their own mining farms. Like everything mm -hmm. we've been talking about today is more about exchanging coins that have already been mined and generated. But a lot of people may not realize that to initialize the coin, you have to do some math compute functions. And basically you, you, uh, and then there's like, whether or not you, it's a spurious hit and you get the right, uh, value whatever. Uh, but anyways, you have to buy a bunch of computers and grind it, right? Um, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts around this particular topic or about, you know, just anything interesting around the mining and kind of that whole thing? Yep. Give me 45 seconds to level set us and then we'll get into the details. All right. Right. Cryptocurrency mining is the process by which computing power solves really complicated algorithmic mathematical problems. That's what guarantees the security of the blockchain. That's what verifies transactions, all that stuff. When Satoshi initially envisioned it, he believed that we would all be running mining nodes on our desktop computers at home. 
Well, if you run this node, uh, you're, you're using your hardware and you're using your electricity to, to perform these calculations. And in response, you get what's called a block reward. So it started off at, at, and it halves every four years. Started off, well, now the block reward, every 10 minutes, somebody earns 6.25 Bitcoin. We'll do the math on how much money that is. That's a lot. Uh, and so, you know, as people are wont to do, well, if I can do that with my CPU, how about if I use my gaming computer? Let me use my graphic processing unit chip and use that to mine. Super. Well, I mean, if I'm making that kind of money with my GPU now, what if I use my ASIC, my application specific integrated circuit that I'm only making to mine? Now I can do it even faster and I can win more block rewards. Super. Well, that's, you know, now I've got one. Let's put two together. Let's put four. Let's put 10. Let's put all of mine with all of yours and form these pools. And so it was basically this arms race of processing power that became used for mining cryptocurrency. And that's part of the reason why some people say it's economic or it's uh, uh, the it's, it's bad for the environment. It uses a lot of e electricity. Now, I would argue that it uses slack electricity and there's a lot of places where that's that's not really it's a bit of a spurious argument but fine let's skip that for now okay so that's what's happening well where can you get the biggest bang for your buck one you can mine in places where it's naturally cool because a lot of electricity as you guys know that run really you know high flute and supercomputers it takes a lot of electricity to keep that cool otherwise it's going to over overheat and you know melt down so places like you know northern europe or canada or places like that are where where a lot of these move to or you want to go to a place where there's cheap electricity, cheap electricity being government controlled electricity or something like that. A lot of these mining farms sprung up in China. At one point, there was about 60 percent of the hash rate. The, the computing power solving these problems was based in China. The Chinese government has and there's there's actually it's a really cool separate story all about why China is doing this. And I'm happy to dig into that. But for our purposes now, China is starting a central bank digital currency, a CBDC, the digital yuan. That is going to be their cryptocurrency of choice. They have prohibited the trade and mining and all that stuff of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Well, what's that? what that has done is forced all these miners that were in China taking advantage of free or cheap electricity, other places, Kazakhstan, Northern Europe, the US. Shockingly enough, we're moving a lot of crypto power into the US, which is awesome for us. I mean, for, for the US, it's great. So now well, you've got uh, markets for secondhand GPUs. You've got markets for secondhand ASICs, markets for secondhand CPUs. Now, unfortunately, because the world is just the world and people are always going to take advantage of other people, a couple different things are happening there, right? Some of these secondhand GPUs don't work as fast as they were supposed to work uh, or in even worse scenarios, they come preloaded with malware. So when you mine that, you use your computing power and your electricity to mine something, it sends the cryptocurrency to somebody else's wallet, not your wallet. Because, you know, people are always out there to make a quick buck. Uh, and I, God, I would love to talk about some of the ways that people use those kind of things to generate currency because uh, there's some really cool stories. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. That's a little bit about mining and sort of what's happening with China right now with uh, with the mining hash power there. No, I, hear how hear how North Korea takes advantage of you not patching your computer to generate income. I'm happy to tell that story. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is so this is exactly people. This is exactly what the the conversation was like with with Charles a couple of weeks ago when I met him, he's just like, well, I got this story, this story, this story, this story. And I'm like, he's like, but I won't get into that. I'm like, dude, like, let me go pop some popcorn. I'll throw a seat down or a beanbag chair. You just go, you do you. Okay. So we do have a hard stop at five 30. So um, you let, let's get one story, Charles. It, it's either why China is uh, digging into crypto, like um, the, the mining of it and all that, mm -hmm. or why North Korea doesn't want us to patch our computers. Uh, yep. I have a suspicion where that is. You tell, you choose, pick, pick your favorite story and share it with us. And then we'll, we'll wrap up. Nobody gets mad when you beat up on a North Korean. So let me do that. Okay. Uh, okay. So there's something called crypto jacking, right? So what we just talked about is using your computing power to mine cryptocurrency. Well, for the North Koreans, the Reconnaissance General Bureau, right? They create these bot armies. They, they send malware out and infect your computers that they use for their offensive cyber operations. But because they're North Koreans and they're super smart, and we're pounding them with economic sanctions. They looked at that and they said, well, man, my bot is awful lazy. When I'm not sending it out to war, it's just sitting there. What else can I do with it? Well, now what they do, they drop malware on the computer that not only takes it over as a bot, but it runs a mining program on that computer. So how many people out there's computers been like sluggish? And you're like, ah, I've got too many windows open or I need to clear my cookies out or whatever. Probably. Or the North Koreans have got your computer. They've dropped mining software on that. And you, in fact, are mining 
cryptocurrency that's going back to the North Koreans to fund the regime. So for the love of God, update your up, update your cybersecurity. And if you've got, you know, restart your computer from time to time and all that good stuff. But I just think that's the coolest thing because, you know, not not because I like North Korea, but, you know, tip of the professional hat. How do you use your resources to take advantage of other people's resources to generate income? It's fascinating. And, and crypto jacking is just the coolest. It's really interesting. And there's a lot more irony to it. and There's a lot more nuance to it in detail. But that's my that's my PSA today. Uh, update your security software for the love of God. Stop using Windows 7. And, and whatever else, mm -hmm. uh, or you may be supporting North Koreans. Yeah, and I'll also uh, you know, jump on top of that because it is a cybersecurity thing, which I do know something about. Yep. Um, so like they, lo they love to use browser extensions too, right? So like if you're trying to download some browser extension that's going to allow you to play music or, down or rip uh, YouTube videos locally to MP4s or wh whatever it is, uh, it could be uh, basically a Trojan, right? That's It looks like one thing and it does that fine. But it's also mining cryptocurrency uh, for for you know whatever the North Koreans or whoever it is uh, this time of day. I've also heard a story. Um, it was in Ukraine. It was a criminal enterprise, but they had basically uh, taken over or somehow hooked in to the, the the municipality power plant, and basically they had a crypto mining farm but it was like at the power plant and and they they discovered it it was like in a shed or something you dude know? there are so many stories like that one of my favorite was the rup the russian nuclear weapons development center that had these supercomputers that some engineer at night plugged in a crypto miner in there yeah. any and now here's okay a couple quick things for you for cybersecurity professionals out there if you work for a company that has a significant amount of computing power you absolutely should be looking for illegal downloads of of crypto mining software Every company's got it, whether you've detected it or not or know what you're looking for, you should be looking for it. People are using your computer power to mine cryptocurrency. Second, please, for the love of God, don't be the crypto, don't be the security researcher. And I, I air quote it because when I'm given a brief on it, I don't call him out by name, but I, I certainly make fun of him where he said, well, you know, uh, malware on computers. And the North Koreans are using really, really sophisticated exploits that they, they bought from the dark market that were stolen from NSA. So this ain't jokes, right? This is Deep Blue, this is uh, Eternal Keep. These are things that are just really, really, you know, high fluting. The researcher says, yeah, but they're, they're using it to infect all these computers with cryptocurrency miners. That seems pretty lame to me. And I'm like, lame? Funding the regime that allows them to build nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles that are aimed at us. That's lame. Yeah. I don't think that's lame. So anyway, don't be don't be that guy. Well, yeah, and I might add, if they do a ransomware incident, they have a let's say 50-50 chance of getting paid, and it's a one-time deal. If they infect all the computers at an organization and it's just mining, they could they could milk that cow for years, right? Yep. Yep. Because again, you're not losing functionality, you're losing a little bit of bandwidth, but who's looking at it? Yeah, exactly. Right? Your computer's sluggish. You just reboot it and go on. Yeah. And who's turning their computer off at night? I mean, not a lot of people do that anymore. So, all right. So, Charles, we're going to be wrapping up. I got to tell you a couple things. One, the, the audience is screaming for a, a second session with you and, and more of a storytelling, less of me talking. Uh, so if you're interested, we can we can look into scheduling that. Um Charles, if someone wanted to get up with you or follow some of the work you're doing, we didn't even get into what you're doing on the side with the Slack channels and all that stuff and messing with people, um, white hat style. But if, if people wanted to get in with you uh, or get up with you, what's the best way to do this? So uh, I've got a couple of companies that do black hat work for white hat reasons, uh, legal and all that stuff. Um best way to find me is on LinkedIn. I don't advertise. I don't have a website. I'm a little bit like the A-team. Uh, if you could find me, I solve your problems, but I'm tough to find. And I'm kind of like the, it doesn't quite fit on my business card well, but, you know, dirty deeds done reasonably priced. Uh, but LinkedIn is the best way to find me. And then I can sort of do a little due diligence on you before I reach back out to you. Uh, I am more than happy to come back and and chat about this. Obviously, I love it. Yeah. This, this alleviates me having to wear out my wife and telling her about the latest crypto thing that she's like, uh, so yeah. <laughs> come back. really appreciate people coming in. Really appreciate people asking questions and being engaged. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Really quick for everybody, uh, before we before we end it, I just want to tease this out for everyone. Uh, I just This was just confirmed today. 
Uh, two weeks from now, we're not doing a live stream next Thursday, but two weeks from today, we're having Heath Adams, the cyber mentor on. He's going to be talking about how his company, TCM Academy, has been kind of disrupting the whole certification education. I know many of you have been following that, but we're going to get it straight from Heath why he's doing this uh, and you know what PMPT is and how it differentiates in the market from you know, EJPT and um, OSCP and, and things like that. So uh, stay tuned for it. It's obviously going to, it's out there right now. You can, you can uh, grab it, but I'll be promoting it on the socials. So don't sleep on that. Cause I'm super pumped about that. Um, Charles, you know, on behalf of everybody in the audience, thank you for your time. Thank you for your stories. Thank you for your knowledge. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I've loved every second of it. I can't wait to schedule the second session with you. Uh, to everybody in the crowd, thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being part of the Simply Cyber community. I love, I love it. Thank you so much. All right. So everybody, until next time, stay secure, okay?